Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Anderson, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome David Miliband and Peter Vidic with, to be with us today. As you know, this is the 12th annual Arthur C. Helton Memorial Lecture. And as many of you will remember, Arthur was, a, was director of Peace and Conflict Studies here at the Council and Senior Fellow for Refugee Studies and Preventive Action. He was killed in 2003 when the hotel in Baghdad, where he and 20 other international civil servants were re serving in the mission of the UN Secretary General Spe Special Representative for Iraq, when that hotel was bombed. This lecture is dedicated to his lifetime's mission, serving the world's humanitarian and refugee crises. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to welcome Jackie Gilbert, his widow, and Pamela Krauss, his sister, and all of Arthur's friends to be with us here today. As you know, we are joined by David Miliband in his capacity as President and Chief Executive Officer of the International Rescue Committees, formerly Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs of the UK, as you know. And Peter Wittig is Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to the United States, also served here at the United Nations. Thank you for both for being with us. Yesterday, as most of you know, was World Refugee Day, and it came with more dismaying news from the UNHCR. Wars and persecution have driven more people from their homes than at any time since the United Nations began keeping records. On average, 24 people were forced to flee each minute in 2015, four times more than a decade ago. Now we have about 65 million people displaced, and it's the first time since the UN was established that we crossed the 60 million mark. 25 of million of those are, have taken refuge outside their home country. The dangers are at home, obviously, it's why people are moving, in transit and in the receiving countries. As the UN High Commissioner said recently, more people are being displaced by war and persecution, and that's worrying in itself, but the factors that endanger refugees are multiplying too. Uh, at sea, a frightening number of refugees and migrants are dying each year. On land, people are fleeing war, finding their way to blocked and closed cord borders. Closing borders, he said, does not solve the problem. I'll be turning to Ambassador Wittig to give us a sense of some of the political ramifications of this exodus, particularly in Europe and North America. But perhaps we can start with you, David. Can you tell us a little bit about who the refugees in the Middle East are? Where are, what, where are they? What are they fleeing? Why are we seeing this kind of enormous uptick in this problem? Well, thank you very much for the question. and. Uh, Thank you to all of you for being here. I think I should first of all uh, acknowledge that it's a real honor to be commemorating the extraordinary life uh, of Arthur Halton, who was clearly a humanitarian of extraordinary dedication and uh, devotion. And so I, I really feel privileged to be here uh, today. Um, you asked about the Middle East, but I think it's right to put the figures that you gave in a global context, 21 million refugees, 40 million internally displaced, 3 million asylees in the 65 million uh, figure. And while Syria and the Syria crisis is the poster child for the worst of the humanitarian crisis, it's important to remember that Somalia, the civil war, carries on two generations on. Congo, massive uh, refugee flows. I was in the northeast of Nigeria at the end of last year, 2.2 million internally displaced uh, people there. So of the 21 million refugees, 5 million are from Syria, uh, 7 million IDPs internally displaced of the 40 million, uh, 7 million are Syrian. When, specifically on your question, where are the Syrian refugees? Uh, they're predominantly in the region. Uh, about um, four and a quarter million are in the Middle East region. And that is consistent with the global trend, which is that Contrary to the image that you'd believe if you read the newspapers, there are not hordes of refugees entering Western societies. The vast bulk of refugees, about 85%, are in poor countries, not rich countries. Poor countries are joining countries in conflict. Uh, of the uh, five and five plus million Syrian refugees, 
Turkey has the largest number, 2.5 to 2.7 million refugees, which is an extraordinary um, load. Uh, Lebanon, a country of only 4.5 to 5 million people, you know Lebanon well, has at least 1.5 million refugees. Uh, so fully one third of the, Syrian, of the uh, Lebanese population now uh, Syrian um, refugees. Uh, Jordan, there's some contest over the figures, 650,000 official figures. The government of Jordan would say there are more. There's about 250,000 Syrians in Iraq, actually, who, in our experience, we've got 2,000 people on the ground inside Syria and about 1,500 in the neighboring states. Um, the 250,000 Syrian refugees in Iraq probably get a better help, more help, than the internally displaced hmm. from Mosul and elsewhere inside uh, Iraq. And then you have the European end of the crisis. A million or so um, asylum seekers arrived in Europe last year. Not all of them, though, from the Middle East. I mean, probably a third of them came from, or, or even slightly more, maybe 40%, came from Afghanistan, maybe Somalia, maybe elsewhere. And certainly the bulk uh, inside Europe at the moment are those, that, that million. There are 50,000 in Greece. The vast bulk of them, probably 900,000, 850,000 are in Germany. Um, Sweden uh, has a, a smaller number, much smaller number, uh, in the tens of thousands. And the final part of the jigsaw is that uh, while the flow from Syria into Europe has been more or less paused by the quote-unquote deal between the European Union and Turkey, uh, demonstrating more about the power of the Turkish government to turn on the tap and turn off the tap than, the, uh, than what it demonstrates about the, the, the deal, um, the tragic scenes that were in the news two weeks ago were the second route to Europe. The, the first route being from Turkey to Greece, the second route being from North Africa uh, to Italy. And in our judgment, we've got people in Libya as well as um, in Greece and in Serbia and Turkey, is that you're not yet seeing displacement of Syrian refugees from Turkey round into North Africa and then going north into Europe or trying to go north into Europe, you've got um, essentially Africans going through North Africa or going through Africa and then up into North Africa and then trying to get to mm -hmm. Italy. Uh, one in 20 uh, two weeks ago were dying on the way uh, in uh, the sea. So you can see the gravity. Pro sorry, that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's actually what I did want. That is to say, the scale of this problem is um, it, it may not be precisely focused on Europe as much as we and in Europe think is the case, but it's a staggering problem and it will be a problem. I wonder, before we get to the receiving countries a little bit, whether there are changes in, if you will, the patterns of who is displaced and who it, because it seems to me the press reports, you see a lot of families, you see a lot of children. Is that typical of refugee flows? It seems to me that one wouldn't expect to see as much of the you know, unaccompanied children and families with very small children and so forth? I mean, it's very mixed. Uh, the, and different stages of the Syrian crisis have, have seen different people leave. I mean, to state the obvious, um, the wealthiest people left first, uh, uh, right at the beginning. Um, you then had a period in 2011 where people was ho were hoping it was a, would be a short war. And so the refugee flows were relatively limited. Um, but then by 2012, as the scale of the, the intensity of the conflict grew, uh, you, you had a large number of people getting out of Syria. And I, I think that, that there's no reason to believe it wouldn't be families trying to get out because men take their wife and kids as well as um, widowed uh, w w women with right. kids getting out. But then when it came to the flow to Europe, there's been ebb and flow in the numbers. So there were periods when there have been large numbers of men going and then swinging back to um, a much more balanced uh, uh, grouping. And uh, you've seen, I don't know how many of you have seen the pictures of people crossing from Turkey into Greece, uh, but lots of kids, lots of women on those, um, exactly. on those shores. It, uh, it, maybe the ambassador can comment on this, but I think in Northern Europe, it's said that in Sweden and in Denmark, there's a lot more men who are applying for asylum in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia. Um, but essentially, you've got people fleeing for their lives, and people go with their families if they can, if, if at all possible, uh, to do so. It's worth saying, just, uh, I'm sure we'll come to this later, uh, 
The US has a flagrantly low number of Syrians who've come here, 2,500, but one interesting point is that less than 2% of the 2,500 Syrians who've come here in the last five years are single men. So one of the myths that are put around is that um, there's loads of single men right. coming into America. That's actually not true. Right, okay. That's, I think that, in fact, answers the question um, exactly. So the humanitarian issues would seem completely compelling. We see the pictures, we see what's happening and so forth. And yet, in Europe um, and in Germany, in the EU as a whole, even in North America, there's enormous resistance. Um, where is the resistance coming from? What talked a little bit about how this is seen, particularly from Germany and Europe. Well, let me first of all thank you, Lisa and Richard and the council for having me here. I'm also privileged to be uh, on a panel with David um, Miliband, whose work and whose organization I really admire for the wonderful work they're doing worldwide. Um, you said uh, a record number um, of people are uprooted. I think we've got to understand this is a um, movement of people of, of epic proportions. It, it is uh, the first digital migration of people. And, and it, I think we've got to realize it will not go away in a year or two or three. We, we, this is with us to stay for, for a long time. And uh, this is something we've got to communicate to our people. I'm speaking here uh, on, on behalf of my government. Uh, and, and that is a difficult message to convey. Um, the message is there's no single lever to pull to stop this flow of, of refugees, of asylum seekers, of migrants, but we have to address the complexity of the situation through sort of multi-layered measures. We have to look at the root causes. We have to address the root causes of conflict. That means we are in there for the long haul. We've got to support the neighboring countries of those um, that are adjacent to the zones of conflict. In the case of Syria, it's Lebanon, it's Jordan, it's Turkey, so that the refugees preferably stay there, so in order to return easily once the conflict is over. And in the case of Europe, we have to come to a common European refugee and asylum policy, which is a tall order in a European Union that consists of 28 sovereign nation states. And, and then in, on a national basis, we have to think hard and engage proactively in an integration policy. Um, of course, we hope that many refugees can return home uh, because the conflict has been solved or the cause of persecution. But we've got to be realistic. A lot of them that come to our countries will stay, and we've got to begin now to make, go the extra mile, make extra efforts to integrate them. So no easy answers, no one level to pull, no one wall, no uh, shutting of borders, but addressing the complexity of the issue. And that is difficult to digest for you know, uh, the, the rank and file voters in many countries. And it has had huge repercussions not only domestically in many countries of Europe, it has upended in some cases so the, the political, the party system, but also it has put a lot of strain on the coherence of the European Union, and it is probably the most challenging, I hesitate to say existential, but almost existential crisis of Europe since World War II. So this is the effect it had compounded by other factors on, on the European Union. I actually, I address this to either one of you actually. One of the things that's sort of a puzzle is that we treat refugees as a crisis and an emergency, but as you suggest, this is sort of a permanent, um, or we should mm. be addressing this as if it were a permanent element of modern life. Um, and as I understand it, most people are refugees for a very long time, even those people who do ultimately return home. So how do you deal with a permanent crisis? Well, we're an international refugee resettlement agency in the US, but we're also an international humanitarian aid agency. So we see the full arc of crisis. And I think, first of all, as a factual point, less than 1% of the world's refugees went home last year. Right. So 
uh, people aren't going home. If you go to the Dadaab refugee camp, which, I, which is the world's largest refugee camp uh, in eastern Kenya, um, 360,000 people live there. It's a small city. 100,000 people are born there. So if you say, will you ever go home? They say, well, what do you mean? This is my home. Hmm. So uh, I think that's just the, the information point. I think that uh, my own view is that this quote unquote crisis, if you say how, how are we gonna deal with a state of permanent crisis, it, it suggests a degree of stability. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this is not a stable crisis, it's a fast, it's a dynamic uh, crisis because it's not, it would be bad enough if you had 20 million refugees year after year after year. But that's not the case. You've got growing numbers of refugees. I mean, the world's newest nation, South Sudan, has added 450,000 refugees in the last two years. So you've got this, uh, uh, these trends, the weak states that are unable to meet basic needs uh, and unable to contain difference within peaceful boundaries. You've got a weak international system, which is divided at its core. Uh, it, 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 uh, and uh, the ambassador can speak to, to some of the elements of that from both his, his New York experience and his current uh, position. And you've got, sorry to say it, fundamental questions being asked in the Islamic world about the reconciliation of Islam with, democ with modernity. And it is, I always, I feel honor bound to say to, uh, to, to audiences, the IRC was founded by Einstein to rescue Jews from Europe. Today, 40 to 50% of our work is in Muslim majority countries where religion is at the core of some genuinely existential questions. And the Syria crisis is a very good example. It's not the case that all Muslim majority countries are unable to reconcile Islam with modernity, you know, Indonesia, Bangladesh, etc. But if I think about some of the biggest programs we run in Syria, in Afghanistan, even in the Central African Republic, where it's actually religious tension between Muslims and Christians, uh, you've got really deep, long-term issues that are not going to be resolved anytime soon. So I think that um, the, the roots of the crisis are, are important to diagnose if we're to even begin to think about what are the antidotes. Well, it is true. Apparently, two-thirds of all refugees are Muslims, suggesting that there is some issues there in the Muslim world that have to be addressed because they're just sending people out. They're not obviously happy or comfortable at home. But that also suggests a ways of thinking about why it is that people are so concerned about absorbing these populations, particularly in Europe. Well, I think that that is one elephant in the room that most of the refugees that are coming now to Europe are of Muslim faith. And um, I still think, at least in my country, there's a general support for the refugee policy of uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, but there is a growing doubt um, whether uh, um, the values of some of those refugees or migrants or asylum seekers are compatible with the values of our liberal democracy. And, and that's why we have now a, a right-wing party uh, that puts Islam uh, on top of the agenda, saying uh, they, they have to adapt to our values. So it, is, um, it goes deep into the psychology of, of people, of voters in Europe, much deeper than in the U.S. Um, ironically, only you know the U.S. has only 0 0.6 um, Muslims as its population. In Germany, it's five percent. In France, it's seven or eight percent. So the, the the Muslim population is bigger, but it 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 it, it plays a, a very big role in the discussion. What what we do now in Germany is we offer um, not only language courses or programs to get people into jobs more easily or assisted, have, give them assisted vocational training. We also offer so-called integration courses teaching uh, the newcomers about the values of our democracy, including uh, the, the respect for, for, for gender, uh, for um, other religions, in our case, um, you know, respecting our laws concerning the Holocaust, denial of Holocaust, uh, our special relationship to Israel, etc. So we have to proactively do something to um, show that 
uh, Islam and, uh, and, and our values of the liberal democracy can be compatible, but that's a challenge. Although it's interesting that, remember, two-thirds of the American public didn't want Jews to come here in the 1930s. Right. So the figures are similar generation to generation, and in the UK, um, I, I did promise Richard I'd get Brexit in somehow into this. The, uh, um, in the UK, uh, a lot of the, the, the whole of the debate about migration is about Catholics from Poland rather than about uh, Muslims. So it, it's important. It, the, the, I mean, the truth is that how different, how people who are different from each other learn to live together is one of the defining issues of the modern age. I mean, that's the right. that's the point. Right. No, and of course, when you think about Germany and You've, Germany has had Turkish workers for decades, and of course France has had people from North Africa for decades. Um, so there is something that this is sparking an anxiety that goes well beyond the kind of modern history of... Well, there were some lessons from the Turkish uh, immigration in the 50s and 60s to be drawn. I mean, there was an Im immigration from a moderate, moderate very moderate, um, Islamic nation, you know, still under the banner of, of the secular Ataturk uh, philosophy. Um, today, it's it's a different um, context. Um, uh, but uh, I think the lesson that we draw here is that we have to proactively offer language, um, offer job opportunities, um, o offer vocational training, and offer our our uh, sort of vision of um, a liberal democratic order, and we, I think in the, in the long run, we would need a kind of European Islam, you know, that is compatible with, and I think it is possible, and, you know, London elected a, a Muslim mayor, um, perfectly in sync with, with all the values of, of the UK, so it is, it is possible, but it takes, I think, um, active measures to, to accomplish that. Let me ask one final question of the two of you before opening it to uh, the members here. Um, you, in a sense, represent different approaches. One, one is governmental. I mean, clearly the public sector, the government of Germany, of the EU, mm. the United Nations all have a sort of, uh, you know, obvious role. You represent the civil society kind of perspective on, are there ways that you think that either, that, y that you imagine a more effective collaboration across sectors? Is there a role a private sector might play here? Um, are we missing creative opportunities to think about addressing this permanent emergency? After you, it's, 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 all, it's the fault of the politicians, so why don't you go first and then I'll, t I'll explain how we're cleaning up. Uh, I, I think the magnitude of this of this um, inflow of um, refugees and asylum seekers and migrants uh, cannot be tackled by governments alone. It, it is a sort of a, a multi-stakeholder um, affair, if, if you will, and, and we need all the volunteers. And in my country, uh, to my great and pleasant surprise, we've seen you know, an outburst of volunteerism uh, when, 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 when the refugees came in great numbers. So we need that civil society engagement. And, and we need, of course, the business to go along. This is where the jobs have to come from. And, and, and some of the even big businesses in Germany uh, had a sort of avant-garde function. You know, I, I don't want to name brands, but the big automakers immediately offered you know, places for apprenticeships and so on. So this is not just uh, an, a, a thing of the governments. It is the whole society, including business and, and the civil society, has to be brought into that, into that challenge. Well, I, I strongly agree with that. But I, I, I frame it as follows. The humanitarian sector has been an afterthought in politics, government, and diplomacy for a very long time. It's been an act of charity that has been reactive that has been defined by natural disasters and emergencies, that has been expected to be short term, and uh, that has been anticipated to be succeeded by a return to the status quo ante. None of those things are true. And if we carry on trying to run an old style, charitable, reactive, short term 
the system, we're going to continue to fail, which is what we're doing at the moment. And the gap between humanitarian need and humanitarian provision is going to grow, which it's doing at the moment. It's not just there are more people in need compared to the growth in the number of people who are being helped. It's that the complexity and depth of their needs is outstripping the capacity of the, of the sector to respond. And I think it's very, very important that we think in completely new ways about the way this sector runs. The sector is defined by refugee camps, but 60% of refugees are not in camps, they're in urban areas. So they need employment uh, and they need housing in a wholly different method than before. The sector is defined by short-term life-saving, when in fact for the generations that are in camps or in urban areas, education is as important as healthcare. That's not been taken on board in any uh, systematic way at all. Thirdly, refugees are in countries that aren't presumed to be poor. And the whole of the development system, the system of tackling poverty globally, is based on the fiction that you find poor people in poor countries. Whereas actually there are lots of poor people in fragile, lower middle income countries like Lebanon, Jordan, Kenya, Ethiopia. And so we need to change the way in which the global system thinks about poverty and crisis in a very serious way. And I would put on your agenda for the council there's a new UN Secretary General being appointed. What questions are being asked about the vision, ideas, commitments of that person to address these points? We're actually going to release in the next week or so um, eight or nine questions that we're going to send to all of the candidates mm. asking for their response on how they're going to prioritize and address the humanitarian uh, crisis because in the public it's very good that there have been the public uh, fora but very few questions have been about the humanitarian system and the humanitarian the, the questions of humanitarian policy go to the heart of the fundamental question for the next secretary general which is is he or she more of a secretary or more of a general mm. <laughs> and that I say that in all seriousness because either they are there to take the notes of the big powers or they're there to actually be a more active and proactive participant in the shaping of the decisions of the big powers. And it's obvious that the Secretary General of the UN serves at the, um, with the confidence, not just of the Security Council, but of the whole General Assembly. But it's also important that this person is empowered to make a difference, not just to maintain the status quo, because the status quo is so obviously failing. Well, this, we could discuss the, the implications of sort of normalizing the responsibility to protect and demilitarizing the responsibility to protect and so forth might be one way of thinking about that. But um, let me now open the floor for comments. Now let me remind you before you say anything that this meeting is on the record. Um, wait for the microphone. We'll start right over here. And please tell us to stand. Tell us who you are, sir, right here. Yes. Um, tell us who you are, your name and affiliation, and then be concise. Bill Drozdiak, McClarty Associates. Uh, I wanted to ask both uh, speakers, how do you deal with the policy um, conflict between uh, two factors? One is demographics. In Europe, uh, Peter, everybody knows for decades now, there's been <clears throat> an enormous shortfall, and so you, one would think politicians should be able to persuade their people of the need to embrace more immigrants in order to sustain their lifestyle and pay for uh, pensions in the future. Uh, and the same, uh, David, in Britain, where uh, you've had 330,000 come from uh, this year, even though the government said there would only be 100,000. Uh, and it's been a benefit for uh, the UK economy. If it is politically unpalatable, to what extent would people and politicians be willing to pay for massive Marshall Plan-like programs to develop economic uh, devel uh, programs in uh, the North Africa and the Middle East in order to encourage these young people to stay home, particularly given the fact that 70% of their populations are under 30? Um, great question. I think that the, I mean, I'm obviously based in New York now, so I'm speaking about the UK from a distance, but uh, to be fair to the current government, they've maintained what the previous government started, which was Marshall Plan style levels of expenditure on overseas aid. The 0.7% of GDP is spent on overseas aid. Um, it's very, very good. The US figure is 0.21%, just by way of comparison. Um, now, the, the, the difficulty, I think, is less about 
the funding, which if you've got determined political leadership, you can get away with. I think that the more fundamental question is twofold. One, is it right to decide on refugee intake on the basis of demographics? I would say no. Uh, the point about the 1951 Refugee Convention is it gave rights, absolute rights, to refugees who have got a well-founded fear of persecution. And my own experience is that when the debate about refugees and the debate about immigration get confused, you end up in trouble. Um, an immigration policy can be decided on the basis of meeting demographic and other economic needs, but a refugee policy needs to honor uh, the distinction between a refugee and um, an immigrant, and I think it's, it's quite important to, uh, to pick that up. The second thing is that the speed of integration or the, the, the scale of the flow and the speed of integration are very, very tricky. I mean, there's a huge challenge in the ambassador's country that if half of those who are applying for asylum for the sake of argument are, de are, de are deigned to be refugees, and the rest of Europe doesn't pick up the relocation slag, that's a massive integration challenge by, for in any, however efficient the state and civil society, that's a massive uh, challenge. And I think that our experience in the US, we work in 29 US cities, is that it is possible to integrate large numbers of people as long as you spread them out. And I think that's the, that's the conundrum that the, that the German government faced. Mm. Yeah, Bill, um, I agree. De demography is, is an important aspect. We are an aging society in, in Germany. We, we, we need immigration. And I think uh, that has been a paradigm shift in the last decades that people realize we, we need and we want immigration. But I agree with David, you shouldn't confound those two things. Um, the, the one is a humanitarian challenge and you cannot expect um, uh, by taking in a, a big number of refugees in a short time that they all help to change the demography. Uh, it is a huge investment, it's a huge integration challenge. It, it will take decades to integrate them uh, successfully. Uh, by the way, you mentioned um, sort of the, uh, the, the tendency that they cluster all in, in certain, usually urban areas. And, and we are now, um, in, in a way, um, not only um, stimulate them to spread out, but even by, via legislation oblige them uh, not to go all to the same big cities because we fear that then they will uh, sort of form their, their sub cities and, and you know th th that it makes integration more difficult. Um, th th that's a measure to sort of distribute them all over the country which is not uncontroversial. Some people oppose that uh, also from the NGO community. But th those are all measures to uh, help coping with this uh, really momentous integration challenge that we will all face uh, in, in Europe. Some countries, and I'm again come back to Europe and, and to the fault lines that have emerged in Europe over the refugee crisis. Some, some Eastern European countries come from a different uh, uh, background. Uh, they, they, they are not, uh, they are still very homogeneous uh, societies. They didn't have any immigration tradition, so they find it difficult to share the burden, take in some immigrants. Uh, but in the, in the medium and long term, we have to uh, come to a, a European burden sharing, and I think those countries also have to go through uh, a steep learning uh, curve that immigration is for all of our countries uh, an, an essential in, in, uh, in, in the decades to come. Thank you. Right here. Thank you. Thank you. Travana Weschler with Security Council Report. Um, I have a question actually to Ambassador Viti primarily um, about 2011 and Syria. You were on the Security Council uh, at that point and you lived it very intimately. Do you think in hindsight of five years that something could have been done differently in the council in the first several months of the uh, uh, Syrian crisis? Because the first time the council was able to make even a very, very weak statement on Syria was August. And mm. during those months, things went from distressing to pretty horrible and then mm. to absolutely irreversible. 
Well, I consider in hindsight the failure of the Security Council to act uh, at the beginning of this unfolding disaster in Syria is probably one of the worst failures in the history of the Security Council. And I could pinpoint to some factors that prevented the Security Council to act. And I think uh, one or two uh, veto powers at the time uh, were unwilling um, to sort of jump over their shadow and uh, desist from uh, supporting the, the Assad regime uh, in a 100% in way. And I think that um, prevented the council to open an avenue for a um, transition uh, regime and a dialogue uh, between the various uh, factions in Syria at an early point before it morphed into that kind of ethnic uh, religious, uh, uh, tribal, civil war. So I consider this, uh, and I deplore this. I, li I lived through that and I, I, I felt this was really a, a terrible failure of the Security Council, um, basically because of the, the veto powers of one, of one or two members. Sir, in the middle, yep. Hi, uh, Jim Traub from foreignpolicy.com. I wanted to ask about the EU refugee deal with Turkey, which uh, Mr. Miliband, you mentioned uh, disparagingly, and I know that the advocacy community has been very hostile to it. Uh, but this is something I think Ambassador Wittig could address also, because my sense is that, that uh, Chancellor Merkel thought that the only way that she could gain the confidence of not only the German public but European publics was to convince them that state leaders had gained control over state borders and that this was a recognition of a political necessity, which may be an ugly necessity, but it's a very real one. So is your sense that uh, that, deal, that that political necessity is not so great, that that deal should not have been struck, that, that uh, something altogether different should be done, or rather that maybe its terms, its better terms, need to be more enforced than they have been so far? Yeah, no, obviously it's the latter. I mean, to be fair to myself, what I said was that the deal had engineered a pause was it had given the Turkish government a reason to turn off the tap. Now, uh, I believe we are paying the price now of five, possibly six years in which Europe and Turkey have drifted apart. And there is fault inside Turkey on that, and there's fault in Europe on that as well. Actually, it probably started in 2009. Uh, and the fact that it's now 2016 before Europe and Turkey are talking about what kind of deal can address this is one indication of the problem. Europe is playing catch up. Uh, to be fair to the prime ministers of Greece and Italy, in 2013 they were jumping up and down saying, look, this is a crisis that we've got on our shores here. And no one was really listening to them, in part because you had the euro crisis consuming so much uh, political oxygen, policy oxygen in Brussels, and also then subsequently because of the Ukraine crisis. And so the, refu the, 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 the coming refugee crisis in 2013, 2014 didn't really get much attention. I think the terms of the deal are problematic because the one in, one out so-called idea, if you, if you stop and think about it, from a Turkish point of view, if you want Europe to take refugees, the only way you can do so is to get some people to go out illegally, then have them shipped back, and then you replace them with someone who goes out. <laughs> and that's what the one for one deal means. So I think that there's a real problem in the way that the deal, so-called, uh, has been structured. My own position on this is, one, a legal and orderly pipeline of people coming from uh, the Middle East to Europe, not just from Turkey, but from across the Middle East, is essential. Because if there isn't a route to hope, a legal route to hope for people, then they will be in the hands of the smugglers. Secondly, you can only do that when you have uh, effective European coordination. I agree with what the ambassador said about that there's got to be an opt-in from the uh, whole of the uh, European community. Thirdly, um, we haven't talked about this very much, but European and public opinion, there's an easy excuse for European public opinion at the moment uh, when it says, well, what's America doing about this? What's the Gulf doing about this? There's an easy excuse. So, so it's not just Europe that needs to get its act together. There's a global responsibility. Because the truth is that refugee hosting countries, whether it be Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, or Kenya and Ethiopia, or Pakistan in the case of Afghans, they're delivering on a global public good. And they're not getting supported properly for it. And I think until we address that, we're not going to be able to get to the roots of the problem. 
can I offer no, go my, my, my please, take on Turkey? Please. Um, I agree with David. I think um, Europe was uh, ill-prepared for this uh, refugee crisis. We could have seen the writing on the wall, and I think the European societies maybe didn't see it because other problems were so uh, preeminent. Um, but uh, on, on, on Turkey, uh, Mr. Traub, I, I would say um, the, the, the leaders, and in particular uh, the, the Chancellor, German Chancellor, faced a situation where um, in 2015 we had taken in 1.1 million refugees alone. So that uh, the equivalent for the US would be 4.4 uh, million refugees in a year. And she knew that this couldn't go on in that same pace and that same speed. And so I think the, uh, the, the starting point for this was to realize that Turkey is the gateway, or was the gateway, for, for all the refugees coming from the Middle East, and in particular um, Syria and, and Iraq. So Turkey is and was the key element to, 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 to get a grip on a kind of more orderly controlled mi migration and refugee flow. And we don't see eye to eye uh, on many issues with, with the Turkish leadership or on some issues. But um, in a way, that deal has worked in bringing down the numbers dramatically. And so the philosophy of, of that agreement with Turkey is take away the incentive for refugees to use human traffickers to cross the Aegean from Turkey to Greece, um, rather than going through the procedures in Turkey. And um, that uh, sort of taking the human trafficking, which is a multi-billion dollar business, out of business, um, th that was the, the philosophy of the deal. And it, it, you know, I think critics um, should see uh, that it so far, it, it worked with all the flaws that um, might exist um, in, in the procedure um, between Greece and Turkey. Okay. Right here in the front. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Evelyn Leopold, journalist at the United Nations. Nice to see you again. A question for you. You mentioned Eastern Europe. Um, the anti-immigrant movement in Germany is in Dresden, <clears throat> the former East Germany, and the further you go east, the more <clears throat> spurs of racism and unwelcome uh, gestures to immigrants. Is it because they're not used to having grown up with any foreigners, or they have a lower uh, economic level, or what is it? And uh, Mr. Miller, then while you're asking the Secretary General a lot of questions, can you be British and insist on fluency in the English language? <laughs> <laughs> well, Evelyn, um, it's an irony, uh, to come to your question, it's an irony that in many parts of Europe, the hostility, the xenophobic reactions are most strong in, in those parts where there are no refugees. and. Um, one of the explanations is that, of course, there are many people who are not used to change. And I would um, try to understand some of the Eastern European countries and also the Eastern part of Germany. They've gone through so much change in their life. Um, and, and not all people of all ages can take a lot of change in their lives. So I think uh, this would be sort of the benevolent um, benign um, explanation uh, that in, in many cases um, those who turn against refugees are the losers of globalization. And this is sort of a, a Western phenomenon. We see this here in this country as well. And this, um, I think, is an incentive for politicians, for leaders, uh, not to just write those people off, but um, somehow not uh, try not to lose them explain to them uh, wh why it, it might, might be beneficial to invest in integration, uh, etc. That's a huge task, I know, but um, the, the, we, I think we, the, the, it's, it's, it's important to realize that there were losers. The, the, the last decades were not just a win-win game, um, and, and we've got to look after those losers in a, in a, in a more um, sustainable manner. 
Can I, can I make a point? Sorry to prevent a question, but I want to make a point that links quite a lot of the discussion we had and quite a lot of the questions already. Until the Eurozone starts growing fast, there's going to be a, it's going to be next to impossible to make this work. I mean, the, the economics underpinning integration are absolutely vital to maintaining consent. And there's been the first quarter of this year, the, the figures are better. 0.6% growth, but there's never been a better time for big infrastructure spending, given low interest rates around the world. Um, but that means really thinking hard about some of the economic imbalances within the European Union, never mind globally. And that obviously means there's big responsibility in, in Germany. But my honest fear is that unless, until the economics shifts, we are going to find it very, very hard to make this work. I mean, the uh, the power of economic growth to grease the wheels of integration and to make and to um, dilute tension cannot be underestimated. I mean, in the UK, you've got a huge level of concern about immigration in this Brexit debate, but unemployment's at five percent. If unemployment was at ten percent, I guarantee you it would be a much, much more difficult uh, argument uh, to win. Thank goodness unemployment in Germany is relatively low, but there's an economic element to the stress that's felt in countries like France, which are, about which I'm worried. Um, that is really fundamental. Let me, you said earlier um, that the United States and the Gulf hadn't stepped up and therefore, and we should before we criticize Europeans and so forth. What would, what would you ask the Gulf to do? Well, they could sign they, the Refugee Convention for starters. That would be a good <laughs> start. That would be but a would you expect the them to resettle, the, to uh, have refugees come well, and resettle? Look, one's or, got to be fair about this to the Gulf because some people say, just look at the figures for Saudi Arabia or for UAE, they have zero refugees. That's true because they don't sign the convention. That doesn't mean there are zero Syrians in Saudi Arabia or zero Syrians in the UAE. There are 500,000 Syrians in Saudi Arabia and 120,000 Syrians in the UAE. They're just not classified as refugees. Many of them were there before the war. I haven't got uh, off the top of my head the figures for who've come in the last um, five years. But I think that w we should be uh, upholding the basic principle that all countries should sign the Refugee Convention and that all should contribute to the delivery on the, of this global public good. Okay. <laughs> I could, right here. Thank you. Felice Gear, the Jacob Blaston Institute. Um, you spoke of the practical and economic uh, problems that are created by the current waves of migration and, and refugees. Arthur Helton also cared about the legal aspects. And when speaking about the Refugee Convention, I'm wondering if you think this is a time for the definition of refugee uh, to be looked at again. Is, is that uh, a, an issue? And secondly, um, are the people who are raising security concerns uh, irrelevant, or uh, how would you address those concerns, even if there are only 40 that you can count uh, uh, who are unaccompanied men in the US? Um, well, let me take the second question first. I have absolutely no hesitation in saying, as a, as a humanitarian, it's absolutely right to have security uh, as a factor that uh, plays into this. But I can also say the US, partly because of the blessings of geography, has an extraordinary opportunity to vet those who are, trying to, who are applying to come here and to weed out anyone you don't want. So it takes 18 to 24 months. There are 12 to 15 government agencies involved. There are biometric testing. And if people can't prove who they are, you don't have to let them in. The, the, the burden of proof is on the refugee to prove that they're going to be productive citizens, not on you to, to stop them coming. You've got, you don't have to take anyone. You can, you can make your own choices. And that's what makes this particularly uh, distressing. It's doubly distressing when you think about what refugees have contributed to this country. Because we're not talking about a quote unquote burden. We're talking about everyone from Albert Einstein to Madeleine Albright to Sergey Brin to Andy Grove, who recently died. We, he was resettled by the IRC from Hungary in 1956. And he goes on to found Intel. I mean, this is a country that has not just been done the right thing in admitting <coughs> refugees, it's done a smart thing and actually help produce the, 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 the country that um, we all live in uh, now. So I think that uh, it's right to address the security concerns, but it's not right to fall for fear-mongering. 
Um, and the idea that people are flowing in here without any checks is just simply uh, untrue, and we can speak to that. On the legal side, I tell you my real fear there. I think once you open up the 1951 convention and the 1967 amendments, I don't know where it'll end up. And I think the danger is that we lose the gains that have been made. Now, there are real issues about this. You know, someone who comes from Syria to Jordan, lives in Jordan for two years, and then moves on, yes, they're a refugee, but they've actually been living in another country. They're not a refugee from Jordan. They're a refugee from Syria. So there are, uh, there are issues there, a well-founded fear of persecution. Uh, how does that extend to fearing that you're going to have a barrel bomb drop on the house that you're living in? I mean, there, there are issues there. But my own political judgment would be to, to defend the distinction between a refugee and an, and an immigrant, not that one is good and the other is bad, but they're just different, uh, and not to open up the legal um, questions. Because I think that, um, I don't think you'll get to a, a resolution. And if you do, it won't, be a, it won't be a happy one. Can I add something to it? I, I, I feel there is a new category of people coming um, to Europe in that instance uh, in, in a new gray zone. They are neither sort of politically persecuted or are not fleeing an outright civil war. So they don't really qualify as a, a valid asylum seeker, nor are they just economic migrants that come for a good job. But people who have lost hope in the future of their country that is fragile and unstable and don't see any future for their kids. So that's why so many people, for instance, come from Afghanistan. And they, they, they are not in one of those two categories, but in the middle. And then the, the question is, how, how, how do we deal with those people? And, and potentially, there are millions more mm -hmm. in those categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Sir. Jeff Laurenti, I wonder if you all might be able to compare the conditions in which displaced persons within Syria, inside Syrian refugee or displaced person uh, facilities, uh, compare with A, those in the neighboring countries, and then B, conditions in African situations, because they are entirely off our radar screen, yet as uh, David Miliband told us, you have enormous numbers of Africans who are across the border in refugee camps. And one senses that one of the reasons why when the Italians were trying to get attention was because it wasn't Libyans who were coming uh, for all the chaos in Libya across the Mediterranean to Italy. It was largely black Africans. Do we have comparable levels of care, uh, of, of support, of sustenance uh, in these different situations? Or are some more privileged refugees, in a sense, than others? both in terms of international attention and in terms of the resources devoted to them and willingness to take them in. I defer to you. Um, so uh, if you're an internally displaced person in Syria, that's the worst possible situation uh, to be in, not least because there's still grave danger to your life. Uh, and the, the, the fighting is carrying on, and the bombing raids are carrying on, and y y your life is in danger, and there are no IDP centers. I mean, we're delivering health care in the midst of bombed out buildings. Uh, so uh, then secondly, the refugees who are in um, Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon, uh, they're middle class compared to African refugees. Uh, partly because they're middle class people. Uh, secondly, because they've moved into societies that are more developed societies. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't hellishly difficult conditions that people are living in. Uh, the vast bulk of them are not in camps. The vast bulk of them are not allowed to work. Uh, the vast bulk of them are miss, being missed out by different bits of the humanitarian sector. You go all the way across the Bekaa Valley and you'll see hundreds of thousands of people who, uh, whose kids are not getting an education. 200,000 kids, Syrian kids in Lebanon are not getting an education. Uh, there's no prospect of them having uh, housing. There's informal settlements. Uh, it's a very, very difficult situation. They're subject to new visa checks. It's a very, very difficult situation. They've run out of savings, because these are people who came over with savings. I'm glad you mentioned the situation uh, in Africa, because it's, not, it, it, it's, it, it's very, very serious to be displaced from a poor country to another poor country. I mean, that's a very, very tough situation to be in. Although I would tell you that your survival chances inside a refugee camp in Kenya are greater than those Kenyans who are living outside the refugee camp. 
And that is a big political problem. I'm afraid this is going to have to be the last question. Um, so please make it short right here on the, yes. You the question let the I people have at the is, back speak. Uh, Stephen <laughs> Pike, sorry. What happens tomorrow? As the, as the discussion went on, it, the recommendations offered are, are wise often, but they're middle term at best in case of, say, faster growth in, in Europe, longer term. But the situation in the source countries of refugees is not going to get better. The situation in the camps is going to get better. So what happens tomorrow? What happens next week? What happens in the next year? What is the situation going to look like? And what can be done, in your view, on, on, on more immediately to deal with these concerns rather than waiting for European attitudes to change, or European growth to increase, and so on? So you're going to go out of this meeting. You're going to visit the IRC website, rescue. Or you're going to rally your community to become part of the IRC family by volunteering in the New York or New Jersey resettlement office to mentor new refugees. You're going to rally your local church or synagogue or community to become donors to the IRC so that we can do more. You're going to talk to your plutocratic friends and make them signature investors in the IRC. And I say that not just uh, because it's my job as the head of an NGO to urge <coughs> you to support us, but because American leadership has got to mean American leadership. And the truth is that on humanitarian questions now, Europe is not one country. I mean, Europe's 28 countries. But Europe is now a larger humanitarian donor than the US. I mean, in a way, it's not fair to compare 28 countries to one country. But you like to think of yourselves as the most generous nation on Earth, as the people who are at the forefront of all of the uh, human progress, here's an opportunity to step <laughs> forward. Secondly, on the refugee resettlement, where the US has genuinely been a historic leader and has historically taken 45 to 50 percent of the world's resettled refugees, you're not going to be doing that this year. I mean, this gentleman's country is going to be the world leader in refugee resettlement. And it is within the power of the executive branch of your uh, uh, political system not to say we'll have 10,000 refugees, you can decide how many refugees you take. And you can decide what sort of pressure goes on Congress for overseas aid. And you can therefore decide how you're going to um, share the burdens of globalization while you enjoy the blessings of globalization. And as someone who's not an American but does live here and obviously admires the country uh, hugely, uh, there's an absolutely fundamental debate to be had about what it means to be the world's global superpower. You're not a hyperpower, you're not the you're not the dictatorial power, but you all agree that you're the indispensable power. And figuring out what it means to be an indispensable power in this humanitarian sector is something that needs to that's something that does need to be debated and argued over. And frankly, policy change tomorrow. The president's got a summit on in the UN on the 20th of September. What's going to come out of it? What new commitments is the US going to be making at that summit? And the fact that Richard told me before the, uh, before the show, before the, uh, uh, before the meeting started, that uh, the council is dedicating itself to global literacy around the US. Is that right? Yeah, global literacy around the US. How American citizens think of themselves, not just as American citizens, but as global citizens. That's the kind of thing that's really, really important. Because we all know that the lessons of history are that when countries like the US turn inward, there's only trouble around the corner. So I hope there's some really practical things that you can do uh, coming out of the meeting. I cannot, I cannot <laughs> top that. So I subscribe <laughs> to every word. On behalf of uh, all of us here, I want to thank the council and the uh, Arthur Helton's family for um, permitting us to have what was a very interesting and fruitful discussion.